All right, um, we're going to move on to the next paper, which is Return Predictability Expectations in Investment, Experimental Ev Evidence, and the presenter is Marianne Hungry. Um, Marianne, it's all yours. You have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to present this paper. It's, uh, it's fairly new, so uh, you know, just uh, any comments or suggestions uh, will be more than welcome. This is joint work with a co-authors from Toulouse School of Economics, and it's an experiment, so uh, this is also quite new for me. Um, all right, so starting from the very broad questions, uh, how do people form their expectations? How does it affect their decisions? Uh, we want to analyze these uh, broad, uh, important questions in the context of financial markets, and in particular, uh, con concerning investors and uh, index returns. Um, of course, these are uh, key questions that have been extensively studied, and in particular, the recent literature has uh, shown, uh, documented extensively, that uh, investors appear to extrapolate to form their forecast. So what do we mean by that? I mean that investors not only use uh, past uh, uh, index returns to form a rational statistical inferences, but also that they put greater weight on the most recent return realization. So what it means is that if the market has been going up for the past year, surveys of investors show they tend to expect that returns will continue to go up in the following year. And uh, so this is true both in survey and experimental evidence and the literature is quite rich. Now, of course, in the data, this is not a new result. Uh, the efficient market hypothesis is based on the fact that returns are roughly following an IIT process, especially annual returns do not seem to be autocorrelated. And in that sense, extrapolation is a bit of a puzzle. Now, from this puzzle, we wonder about two key questions. The first one is, okay, how robust are these extrapolations since they are not really justified by the data? And in particular, if we consider a rationalization of extrapolations, what one possible rationalization by Zedig Abex is that it's coming from rational inattention. Most macro finance variables are persistent. So a one size fits all AR1 model would be smart. And so that's why investors extrapolate on index returns, even though these are actually quite IID. Uh, another possible But either way, whatever is a good uh, explanation for uh, the extrapolation, if investors were to receive uh, additional information, I'm sorry, my kid is calling me at the same time, but I'm, I'm going to ignore him. Uh, anyway, so if uh, we uh, provide information to investors, uh, will they be more attentive? Or will they use whatever rational forecast model we provide instead of extrapolation if what they need is to have a pattern in their uh, forecast? So this is the first question. How robust are extrapolative expectations? Now, the second question is, should, does it really matter for investments? We observe these extrapolative expectations. Do investors actually use them to form their investments? Of course, under the classical model, they do. But in the data, we see that there's a very limited path through from variations in forecast to variations in investment. And there's a recent paper by Stefano, Julio, and Corpus showing that. Now, of course, in the data, this may be due to uh, limited attention or transaction costs or anchoring on past decisions. All of these are uh, constraints to having uh, the, the right path through from investments to forecast. So, sorry. From forecast to investment, but in a experimental framework, we can actually and check how much do these variations in investment coming from extrapolation matter for investments. So th this paper is uh, uh, the experiment of this paper is designed to address these questions. Uh, how do we do that? We show in a, a series of rounds that are independent. Uh, we show graphical displays of an index return variable uh, and of a variable A. Subjects are told that variable A can sometimes be useful to predict returns. The uh, experiment is designed so that the risk and the information that we provide is quite close to real world type to real investor decisions. So index return mimics the US equity return, the five year average, which is a reasonable buy and hold horizon considering that investors trade, no, uh, the, the frequency at which investors trade in the data. And variable A uh, replicates when it is predictive. In rounds when it is informative, it replicates the predictability of the dividend price ratio, which once again is not a new result. It's been uh, extensively studied since uh, the late 80s. Uh, in all rounds, we uh, 
uh, we uh, simulate index returns to be perfectly IID on their own, so that extrapolation is never a rational forecast model. Uh, we ask subjects to uh, tell us if the PRC variable A is useful or not, to give us their forecast for the next period return, and to allocate an endowment that we renew every round so that there's no anchoring on previous decision. Uh, we ask them to allocate an endowment between the risk index return and a cashless asset, and they, are, uh, they receive compensation on all three dimensions. Okay, so the main results we find. Uh, and we, Again, it's one of the first time I'm presenting, so I'm going to present only the main results. And these, there are three main empirical results we obtain. The first one on expectation is that subjects seem to follow a dual forecast model. They extrapolate similar to previous work in rounds where they think that the variable A information is useless. On the other hand, when they do find the information useful, they use it exclusively and no longer extrapolate. So we find um, the forecast results will say that extrapolation is not robust to changes in information treatment. Concerning investments, we do find that subjects use their own expectations to, form, to, to choose their allocations, significantly so. However, the path through remains slow, even though in the experimental framework we have, there are no usual constraints that could explain the inertia we observed. We find that the classical uh, investment model is always rejected, even in rounds with information. And that's true even though subjects do use their, their uh, forecasts more in these rounds than in rounds without information. The only case where the classical model appears to be verified is when we look at the path through from forecasts to investments using only variations in forecasts coming directly from variations in the informative signal A. So what we conclude from these results is that extrapolation, uh, for extrapolative forecasts to impact investment, but less so than in the classical model, even in an experimental framework without constraints. And finally, we find that all these results, these two sets of important results on expectation and investment, are true whether we uh, consider individual fixed effects or not. They remain true across individual characteristics. We do not have any evidence in our experiments of heterogeneity in investors' behavior. All investors sometimes extrapolate. All investors sometimes have rational expectations. Their investment decisions are very similar uh, across uh, subjects. Okay, so I'm gonna go very fast. I'm gonna skip some slides. Let me briefly say, I will present the experiment quite fast, and then I will focus on the uh, forecast and investment results. We have a lot of heterogeneity results that I will not go over, but uh, I'm happy to, uh, they are in the, in, in the, in the draft. We also have ad additional information treatments that, again, I will not have time to go over. Hopefully, I can summarize these results uh, towards the end. So let me uh, present the experiment. And just uh, it's simpler to just show you what uh, our subjects uh, observe. So this is an example of what they see each round. The red is the index return. That's what they need to forecast and what they invest on. The blue is the uh, variable A. And we put a yellow dot for the last realization of variable A. Subjects do not know that, but the uh, yellow dot, the lateralization of variable A, is the best forecast for next year returns in cases where variable A is predicted. So this is one example. This is a second example. These two examples are a case for uh, a case with predictability, a case without. And uh, though it might be uh, somewhat clear, so this is the case with predictability and this is a case without, it's not glaringly obvious. So subjects have to uh, observe on their own whether a variable A is useful or not, and then they have to make their predictions and their investments. Uh, once they make their, uh, once they, they uh, give us their, uh, their, their forecast and investments, this is the feedback they get. So here, this is a case where variable A was not useful to predict return, and then they are shown both in the graph and uh, uh, we tell them directly what the return realization ended, ended up to be, whether the forecasts were good or not, and how much their investment portfolio made. So uh, I'm going to skip uh, these things, but just to let you know, as I mentioned, the index return is mimics US equity return at the five year horizon with an IID process. Variable A mimics the dividend price ratio at a five year frequency, it's an AR1 process. In rounds where variable A is not informative, the two time series are perfectly uncorrelated. In rounds where variable A is predictive, it matches the predictability of dividend price ratios in the data, which means that 
the uh, conditional volatility is lower in the uh, realms with information. It goes from 9% in the uh, IID for the IID process to around 6% for the conditional volatility. All right, so what do we find? In terms of main statistics, what we find is that uh, our subjects, so I'm going to do like Georgia, it's actually quite nice. Okay, our subjects correctly perceive that variable A is predictive 80, more than 80% of the time. As you might have seen from the graphs, uh, this is a, a, a quite a striking result because it's not that clear uh, which case is variable A is predictive or not. And actually, subjects are better at noticing when variable A is predictive than they are at uh, correctly identifying when it's not. The difference in probabilities of being correct is significantly lower when A is not predictive. This is somewhat consistent with the psychological uh, uh, explanation for extrapolation as a need to perceive pattern. When there is a ready-made pattern, subjects are better at noticing it. Now, what's interesting too is that the average forecast that subjects uh, make is in rounds with information or why they perceive variable A to be informative, their average forecast is not significantly different from the true average, which is 6.07, and which they are told at the beginning of the experiment to tell them that's the average uh, return. So they make a, a average forecast in rounds with information that are significantly uh, the same as the true average. On the other hand, uh, in rounds without information, the average forecast is significantly below the true forecast. And this is actually something that uh, has been observed in the data as well, including in, the, in this recent paper by uh, Stefano Giulio and co-authors. Uh, so beyond this average forecast, uh, the forecast error, the average forecast error that subject, subjects make is significantly greater in rounds without information, it's around 10%, than in rounds without information. What you can see is that this difference in the uh, forecast error uh, somewhat matches uh, the true conditional probabilities in these two rounds. In rounds uh, without information, the, the conditional uh, uh, volatility is uh, the same as the unconditional one, it's 9%. In rounds with information, it's around 6%. So what this means, uh, even without looking at the dynamics of forecasts with respect to signals, is that somehow subjects must be using the information in rounds with information because they're a forecast error does go down significantly. Uh, finally, what we find is that average investments uh, in rounds with information and with, uh, without information or with perceived information and without are significantly different. In the, so our subjects invest significantly more when they perceive variable A to be informative. Even though this is not uh, directly what we uh, focus on in this experiment, uh, these uh, results partly uh, tell us that it is important to study whether uh, extrapolative expectations matter or not. Uh, in all cases, uh, when subjects uh, uh, do not receive information, they invest less. And what we find is that providing information can have an important wealth effect or significant wealth effect. So moving on from there, uh, let me show you the, the uh, dynamics of forecasts and investments. And so if we start here with forecasts, uh, I uh, simply consider how much forecasts vary with the most recent signal, either in variable A or in index return. So here we look at how much forecasts vary with 80. This is the last realization of the predictive variable A uh, in rounds where it's predictive or not. And uh, uh, RT is the last realization of index return. I don't have a lot of time, so let me show you directly what matters most. So if you, uh, we consider uh, with or without individual fixed effects. Uh, and what, we, uh, what I want you to focus on is uh, uh, if you look at here, uh, this uh, uh, result here, what we find is that uh, in rounds, so predict is a dummy uh, equal to one in rounds where a variable A is perceived as informative. What we see here is that in rounds where information is not perceived as informative, uh, sorry, uh, A is not used. So when subjects do not think variable A uh, is predictive, they do not use it at all for their forecast. They use it significantly so uh, in rounds where they perceive it as informative. So in that sense, they're perfectly rational uh, in, uh, their, uh, uh, in how they consider variable A as informative or not. Further, uh, if you uh, look at these results here, in rounds where they perceive variable A as not informative, uh, ah, well, I cannot highlight it. Um, they extrapolate from the past return. This is column six, so this 0.19. They, they are used the lateralization of index returns 
And this uh, magnitude 0 0.19 is close in magnitude to previous work uh, uh, studying extrapolation in uh, experimental frameworks. So they do extrapolate uh, when they think variable A is not useful. However, if you look at the total loading on R uh, in rounds where they think variable A is useful, so 0 0.19 minus 0 0.16, this is not significantly different from zero. So from this table, what we find is that uh, the subjects use a dual uh, forecast model. They extrapolate from past returns only in the rounds where they think the information we provide is useless. How much they extrapolate is similar to previous work, and it's very significant. In rounds where they think the information is useful, they stop extrapolating altogether, and they start, having a, a, a start using the information we provide. And these results hold with and without individual fixed effects. If I go back to the previous slide, you can see that the magnitudes are barely changed when we look at individual fixed effects, when we include individual fixed effects. Now, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to skip that. But this dual model can be perfectly rational. Can, uh, a test of this model uh, where um, subjects are either perfectly rational when they receive information or completely extrapolative otherwise, a test with quite a lot of sophistication. Remember, our subjects are not sure when a variable A is useful or not, and they are not told how to use variable A in these rounds. We have a fairly sophisticated rational model where they are rational um, in rounds with information, and we find this model is not rejected. I'm going to skip that, but the, the, the test of the model is, is pretty uh, convincing. Now, moving on to investments. Uh, these are the results we obtain. So this is the pass through from, for, from forecast uh, to investment. Let's uh, focus mostly on the last column because I don't have a lot of time. So what we see is that a one percentage point change in forecast uh, has a significant, uh, a significant impact on investments. Uh, they increase uh, uh, investments by 1.8 equivalent money uh, in our uh, experiment. Remember that uh, the average uh, investment is around 40 in rounds without information and 48 in rounds with information. The pass through from uh, forecast to investment is significantly greater in rounds with information. The increase is between 35% and 50% uh, higher pass through from forecast to investment. So what can we say? Yes, subjects do use, the, do use their own forecast. They also use their extrapolative forecast significantly since in rounds without information, they make extrapolative forecasts, and these have a significant impact on investment. Extrapolation does matter for investment. Now, the problem is the pass-through is low in magnitude. Uh, one, percent, one percentage point a higher forecast uh, is around 20% greater than the average forecast. The change in average in the, in the investment is only around 4, four to 5%. So that, that constitutes a puzzle. By the way, let me briefly mention, this pass-through is still much greater than in the data in the uh, work of Stefano, uh, the recent work of Stefano. But is it nonetheless uh, uh, too low or too high? To verify that, uh, we check how uh, it relates to uh, the uh, classical uh, investment model. Marianne, you're so uh, under the yeah, OK, so I'm going to go very fast. Under the classical model, Investors' risk aversion determine both their average investment and the elasticity of investment to forecast. So we we check what the implicit risk aversions are. And let me show you very quickly what we find. What we find is that in both sets of rounds, um, the path through forecast to investment is twice higher or even more than that uh, than uh, the implicit risk aversion looking at average forecast. So the uh, sensitivity of investment to forecast is too low relative to the classical model. Now, we do nonetheless find that they use their forecast more when they receive information. To explore that even further, so this is just the base issue, but to explore that further, and I'm going fast, I know, we look at the pass-through not from forecast, but from the Forecast directly coming from changes in the signal, the signal being the variable A signal in round where it is considered as informative, or the last realization of index return in rounds where investor or subject story extrapolate. What we find is that if we consider only this pass-through, the rounds with a, without uh, predictability by variable A uh, 
are the, the past two remains the, change, the same, whether we look at the whole forecast or the forecast coming directly from changes in the realized return. On the other hand, the past two in round with uh, informative variable A is uh, almost twice higher when we consider only variation in forecast coming from variation in variable A. And this time, when we look at the implicit risk aversion, the classical uh, Merton Emerson model is no longer uh, rejected by our implicit risk aversion. So I'm going to conclude very fast, and I wanted to uh, uh, show uh, the, these uh, heterogeneity results, but let me just make clear these results hold no matter uh, whether we use or not individual fixed effects. What we find is that, let me go directly to the conclusion. What we find is that extrapolation is not robust to information treatment. If, inv if investors are provided, or in our case, subjects are provided with predictive information, even not extremely uh, salient information, they will stop extrapolating and use the information we provide instead. These uh, information treatments have important wealth effects, both in terms of the average investment they make, but also in terms of the implicit uh, risk they take in their portfolios. They do change uh, their investments, they do change their forecasts according to uh, changes in the predictability. It also has uh, implications on their investments. The investments that, uh, uh, that our subjects choose appear to be dependent, yes, on their forecast, significantly so, but also on how much they trust their own forecast. In the end, the forecasts they trust the most are those coming directly from the informative variable A we provide. This seems indicative of a model of investment where model uncertainty matters. This is reminiscent of ambiguity aversion. I don't have time to show you that, but we find that our results are not consistent with min-max standard ambiguity aversion model. It raises the question whether it might be important to consider trust in own expectations beyond a simple ambiguity aversion framework. Finally, we find that our, our subjects are extremely homogeneous in their behavior. We do not have an indication that some subjects are rational and some of them are irrational. This is not what we find. Okay, sorry for taking a, an extra couple minutes. I'm, I'm done. Great, thank you. And uh, the discussion is Elena Asparulova. Elena, um, can you share your slides? All right, looks good. Um, you got 20 minutes. You're on mute. I only I have to stop sharing to unmute. That's fun. Sorry about that, guys. I'm going to share. Okay. We don't see your slides. We see the background screen for some reason. Now. Oh, now we see the slides. Yeah. Okay. First, thank you for the to the organizers for including an experimental paper on the program, and of course, uh, thanks Nick for inviting me. I've been recently uh, like refereeing or discussing a lot of papers that have to do with uh, investors uh, seeing returns. So that's my third one in the last three months and it's been it's been good thank you for giving me the opportunity i'm going to like be very quick i imagine marianne would be very extensive into the results i will be doing a lot of big picture um, discussion but let me quickly summarize so what is this paper the quest is how the investors form expectations forecasts of risk and return we're all asking that right so this is a big big um, questions and how do investors uh, forecasts impact their investments. This is also an important uh, question, especially for uh, very often we do have surveys and ask investors and then we assume that whatever they say will directly translate, say, through Martin Samuelson or whatever model you have directly into investment. And this is an important question, how much forecasts impact investments. So the task is going to be completed with experiment with forecasts and investment tasks. So two tasks uh, will be there graph like people see graph of uh, time series of 20 past index returns and 20 realizations of a variable called a and variable a possibly predictive of index returns this is what subjects know and they have to predict the return in the next period and invest a portion 
uh, of their endowment into it. So what are the results? The results are if A is predictive, participants recognize it 80% of the time and use it uh, to form expectations. If it's useless, participants recognize it only 70% of the time. So participants like to still see mm, relation when there is none mm, and they extrapolate past returns uh, in the cases when they are correct. And there is very low correlation between forecast and investments and especially when A is useless. And uh, a model of expectation formation that has interpolative, extrapolative, sorry, this is not extrapolative beliefs as default, but fully rational expectations uh, when a useful signal is present fits the data remarkably well. So I think that's the paper. And what will I do? I'll do a little bit details on the experiment. Uh, actually, I'll be quick there because Marianne already showed us. And then I'll talk a little bit about the process, but then I'll spend the majority of the time drawing pictures and talking about uh, where this paper fits in the macro, uh, in the macro experimental literature. So I'll pretend to put a little macro hat, although I don't own macro hat, and you guys maybe in the Q&A will judge uh, my, my own view. And I'll have suggestions for them. So let me do a little bit more detail. So this was subject C like uh, you are on your screen as you are now, and you see mm, the blue one is your variable A, it ends with a yellow dot, and the red one is what you have to predict. And your returns and your payoff in this experiment will depend uh, on how you invest into the red asset. So is A predictive or not? What do you guys say? Like is the blue line predictive uh, of, uh, of the red line? Not easy, right? I was saying, yeah, sure, like predictive. The answer is going to be quickly no, but also like what data will they collect? They will collect first thing is the forecast of what subjects think uh, the, next, uh, the next period's return will be. Then they'll be asked for an investment. And in some, not in all treatments, they'll also be asked for a five period uh, forecast, like average uh, yearly forecast and investment for five years. And they're asked, do you think uh, like this is predictive, the blue is predictive of the red? They only have a binary uh, here, yes, no. But in some treatments, they also collect the confidence interval because if you want to fit your Martin Simonson model, you do need the variance right uh, there. So like uh, they do a good job of having that too in some treatments. And then subject C, the realization. So you answer and you immediately get to see this picture. So now you know what you're going to get. And there is also the summary screen. So you invested that much, uh, the return will be 15 point so whatever percent. This is how much you get on your investment. That's your total and that's your five year. And that enters your payoff. Okay, that's, that's it. How about the data? So I will not bore you too much with it, but I'm going to be coming back to it. And the data generating process. So it's uh, like when things are unpredictable, like mu is your best uh, forecast. So the R's are just, the returns are just IADs and normally mm, dist distributed white noise. When not, there is, a, this is the process, the returns are guided by an uh, AR1 uh, process and all the stuff for this AR1 and returns process comes from Cochrane. And I've never noticed, because I don't uh, put my head too much into this, but there is the negative correlation between those two guys, uh, right? So between the returns. Of course, as they go to the experiment, they must, have, they must bury this negative correlation, not bury, but it will be a prominent feature of the experiment because this is the true generating process for the red lines. So the process A, is directly connected uh, to the process uh, of dividend yields and as such it has negative uh, negative error terms with the returns so this is the only way you can generate both iid process for the returns and have an ar1 process that predicts it so that's that's going to be what comes uh, what comes um, in the generation and again the authors have done super careful job 
and like nailing all the details here. So what are the general comments that I have? Given the task at hand, the design of the experiment is super clean and the experiments are very well executed. So like anything you can think of, like, oh, but how about subjects hedging forecasts against investments? Like how do they care, take care of this? They take care of everything, I promise you. So I have only very minor comments there and they'll come at the very end. Uh, the main result that the two regime response is so strong that the specification, as Marianne said several times, doesn't matter. Like fixed effect, no fixed effects, whatever you do, like the result comes and hits you in the head. So there will be only a minuscule comments. I'm not going to uh, question the results any. And the paper is very well written. And so it was super easy to read. My main comment will be on the placement. And since this is a very new paper, I hope this would be mm, useful, useful to the authors. So here is how I view this. And again, like my first time in a macro meeting. So you guys tell me. So what I do is experiments with my diving my little pinky into uh, macro is my experiments in the Lucas asset pricing model, but it's not uh, just us. There is a few set of authors that have uh, gone into that. What is with those experiments? Of course, we worry about expectations. We worry about uh, how those expectations uh, form prices. And there are a few important things. There is endogenous expectations. Participants form expectations about prices, but also in those experiments, there is endogenous price process because they trade. And we as experimenters have no control what in the world those prices will end up being. So prices are sensitive to small mistakes. What do we call mistakes with respect uh, to the rational expectations model? How do we approach this data? We, like uh, my set of uh, co-authors, we took the Adam Marseille Nicolini's uh, paper and kind of did a naive um, replication of their results and matched their prices to our data. And it looked good, but we wouldn't know like whether this is indeed what uh, subjects do. So there is no control over the price process as such. It's very difficult to get uh, what, what the subjects are actually uh, thinking, only like reverse engineering from the prices. So really rough edges on that dimension. So we're going to round those corners in a second. So no control over prices. And I'm going to like uh, get the more rounded corners here. How do you go about that? Well, you are going to have behavioral rationality and heterogeneous expectation. This is Cars Holmes life. And I do have his book here, by the way. I still haven't opened it. I, I have owned it for mm, like over two years now, but I have seen like many talks. So what is Carr super busy with? So he also works with Lucas model, but he exogenizes the price process. And exogenizing the price process gets you to study uh, a lot of what subjects actually do, but also he has been busy again his entire life with those self-referential systems. So his exogenous price process would have a feedback so like the price depends on the forecasts of people and like he has all these convergence results or like divergence results, self-fulfilling mistakes. So this is the other part of the literature. And I'm going to go. So again, exogenous uh, with feedback, though, like this is then there is one that I think we're, we're coming close. Like there is an exogenous, exogenous price process. There is no feedback and people learn about it. So we have uh, the, the papers that were cited and the current work, and this is the Landier and then uh, Afrozi, then like, this is not experimental, but it's survey, uh, Bordalo at all. And a lot of organizing thoughts around it. Of course, we, we heard about Javier Gabek's uh, paper about limited inattention. Recently, uh, Mike Woodworth and co-authors uh, have a very nice model of limited memory and they take experimental, this experimental data and Bordalo's uh, survey data and fit their model into the experimental uh, data. There is also Peter Bozard's uh, work, Excessive Volatility is also a feature of individual level process. So this is the work that I think relates to macro through its excess volatility channel. So all these papers that we see here as um, endogenous expectation, but exogenous price process, 
and excess volatility is a big, uh, big uh, like um, result that is uh, being targeted. And there is the micro foundation, uh, say the limited memory or reinforcement learning. Of course, the limited memory model of Mike Woodward has a reinforcement learning into it. So that's the third uh, part of how I see it. This, again, corners are even more rounded simply because you don't have the feedback effects. You don't worry about those. And then there is the general reinforcement learning literature where like you get to experience like your decisions and the rewards that comes to you. And you're hit each time with either a good outcome or not good outcome. And you keep on revising the way you form beliefs, you take actions. And of course, this is a huge, uh, huge literature. And we know this comes not only in psychology and economics, of course, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, machine learning is based on reinforcement uh, learning and both human and animal model there. So this is, this is the uh, fourth, uh, fourth uh, area. And now comes this paper. Where does this paper fit? I think it kind of sits here in its setup because like it is, it is like if I didn't, if I didn't uh, know that this was going to be presented at the macro, conference yes it does like deal with expectations and such but there is this 20 decisions i get to see my uh, outcomes i get to see so reinforcement learning is itching to be analyzed so here again it, the authors haven't done this yet and they can choose whether or not to do it but the setup is very reinforcement learning mm, one and the suggestion would be like you either go and do that or maybe kind of try to reposition the paper and move closer to those other papers and like you can do the uh, like analysis on what happens with excess volatility like one can even probably move the star a little bit towards the feedback effect so again some clue of how and why do we uh, care about this from a macro uh, macro perspective and i have several more uh, comments i'm with uh, six minutes to spare right uh, four, yes. But... Four, four. Okay, that's okay. So with experimental design, right? So like I, I gave, there was a super care about like the return process being IID. And subjects know that, but they don't know anything about uh, it other than being, uh, no, they don't even know that it's IID, sorry. They don't know that it's IID. Mm, they, they are given the uh, red line and also given the information that possibly uh, variable a is uh, is predictive but here is a difficult task for you i give you a process that you don't know what it is and i ask you give me a test give me a powerful test that based on 40 observations you will reject uh, that is not iid and there isn't one mm, so like unless you have some prior okay this is an error one or error two like some linear process but without that prior with any possible uh, relation in the autocorrelative uh, structure of this process, it would be impossible to reject that it's IID. So in that sense, it's not surprising that people keep on uh, finding finding uh, relationships where there is none, simply because it might be a feature of the experimental design more than people looking uh, to recognize patterns. So I think the authors will have to address uh, somehow that, and many of us are guilty of that. I was guilty of that. Uh, to giving people ID without telling them mm, that it's uh, ID. So like the model also is very special, right? I mean, this to achieve this ID and the way the variable A enters, it's a very simple way, right? You just see the yellow dot and you predict the yellow dot. The rest is very full of ambiguity. So I'm curious how knife edge is the specification? Uh, because the moment, and I'm uh, going to uh, quote what they say in an annex treatment they ask subject to form forecasts uh, for five periods return and then this is difficult task immediately they revert back to extrapolation so this lack of extrapolation is in this very special setup again it would be interesting to know how knife edge uh, this is the next one is they're given i don't know if this is necessary 
but so, like they're given the return but then it's continuously compounded again for the experimental design like would i be a little bit confused why i get this but get a different uh, return so maybe this is just a complication that is not necessary it's necessary for the theoretical development but not uh, to give to the subjects and my final one, I saw that Marianne had an ambiguity aversion little clicker and we didn't get to it, I'm bumped. Uh, it wasn't in the paper, but um, like they say that ambiguity aversion does not explain their results. And then I am still uh, like not fully convinced because I did not see in the paper in the version I got where ambiguity aversion uh, framework is rejected. And it would be interesting to see forecasts with and without investment because we saw like when they do the dual task, they are very pessimistic when they don't know, uh, when ambiguity is greater. And they're like more close to reality when there is less ambiguity. So like if they don't have to invest, would one get to do this? So again, there is a dual task here and investment can be this comparative ignorance or fear of not knowing. So again, I don't know, this could be a little mm, detail. And again, like I am very, very curious about the ambiguity treatment or the ambiguity uh, because there is this new paper of Felix uh, Fattinger and the ambiguity like framework organizes the data in a very similar um, investment task, not prediction task, very, very well. And the statistics, the only thing now I'm almost out of time, but I would suggest to you a cross-classified uh, models so cross classified models probably many of you don't know they came or maybe some do from the school like a student belongs both to a school and to a neighborhood and those two things are not necessarily nested into one another so this is what cross classified means it's a multi-layered model that is not nested so this i think would fit nicely because you have every subject sees 20 uh, 20 different uh, treatments and now every single decision that is made is clustered by subject but it's also clustered by treatment and now as you run those models you have the within level uh, then you have the between treatment level and between subject level all in once in a random mm, ra uh, sorry fixed effects random effects uh, model so this is just just a statistical suggestion and overall, I think it's a great paper. It is in early stages, so I hope you find the comments helpful. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss. All right. Uh, thank you to the presenter and the discussant. And um, as for the last paper, we have 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And um, if you want Marianne to respond to one of the discussant's comments, then you can uh, reiterate her comment to the, author, to the presenter. Um, so it's open for questions. Uh, hey, Marianne. So this is a very cool paper. Um, it seems like there's two separate things going on. One is how do people form their expectations? And two is conditional on having a particular set of expectations. However you got there, what do you do with that information when trading? Uh, it, you're looking at both these things, but you're sort of more focused on uh, the first one. It would be nice if you could sort of cleanly separate these out by also including a treatment where you just give people the best possible, like the right beliefs and see what they do with it when trading. That way it's nothing about actual like, you know, expectation formation. It's just, you know, what do people do with the information? And then you can compare that and make sure that the actual rates at which they respond to sort of changes are the same in both cases when they're actually forming beliefs and when you just give them the right numbers. Right, so, so I didn't have time to go over that. So we have some treatments where we uh, reduce some of the uncertainty uh, so there are some treatments where we tell them when a variable A is useful or not. Uh, and what we find is uh, it changes a little uh, what they do, but not by that much. They seem to be very self-aware of how good they are at spotting uh, when the information is useful or not. So it doesn't change that much. Uh, now we have a, we, we did a final experiment that we haven't included in the paper yet because it was during the lockdown. So it was not under the same conditions where we tell them what the right model is. We tell them that it's IID uh, when it's IID, and we tell them that uh, it's the final uh, realization of A is the one they should use. And then uh, they, uh, they follow that rule perfectly well. They stop, uh, like, you know, the, the, the path through from uh, their forecast to their uh, investment is much stronger. So it seems that it's still in a preliminary stage. We're trying, uh, so uh, I apologize about the ambiguity aversion. We just have some very new results. And the, the reason why uh, I, I think there's a strong flavor similar to ambiguity aversion in that 
how much they trust the model matters a lot. But we see no asymmetry, like whether the, the, the final signals are low or high. Uh, under a BBC version, a low signal should be uh, put more weight on than the high signals, even if they don't trust the model that much. And that's not what we find. So that we're still in the, in the process of trying to understand better the investment part. That's why the forecast part, our model works very well. That's why we, this is what I spent more time on. But the investment part, we're still working on exactly what's going on. But in general, what we find is that they use their investment not that much, uh, their forecast not that much. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. Uh, but, um, yes, the thought is give them the posteriors, not the information about the right model. Just give them like all the like just the right answer at the end and see what they do with it. Well, so what we find that again, it's not under the same condition. So we haven't included it in the paper. We'll probably put it in the appendix. But when we tell them what the simulation processes are, they have a perfectly rational expectation. So they know what the best forecast is. And then we find that they use, a, you know, like a, in the IID case, they don't change that. They they don't use their model uh, that much. Uh, they use it a lot more when the, they receive information now that there's no more uncertainty on how to use the information. So, so just to follow up on that, I, so in this case, when you tell them what the correct forecast is, is there sensitivity, let's say not in the IID case, but in the case that the returns are predictable, is there a sensitivity um, then to this forecasts rational in the sense that you don't have this gap between the, the, the kind of the risk conversion implied by the levels and risk conversion applied by the elasticity. Uh, because that would suggest, if that's the case, this would suggest that this gap might itself be due to kind of uncertainty about, uh, about my forecast, right? So then the right benchmark is a Bayesian model, right? Where you start from some, some prior about how how predictive this variable is, right? What, and then over time you learn, but of course, if, if you have pretty dispersed uh, the diffuse prior, then you're gonna have a lot of uncertainty about the, the, gonna, the, the sharp ratio that goes into your Martin formula is no longer the, the, the true conditional sharp ratio. It's a conditional sharp ratio where the variance is blown up by the uncertainty of your, uh, of your posterior, right? So yes and no, because so in the, in the treatments where we ask them for confidence intervals, uh, they also are pretty, they know pretty well what the confidence intervals are. So they seem to understand the risk in the actual investment quite well. Uh, it's not clear to me how they include the risk in their own forecast. They, they actually do pretty well. So it's not completely obvious to me why uh, they, you know, they, they should not uh, it's not it's not clear to me now to answer your question on the case where we tell them what the model is um, the past three is greater they still have some uncertainty we don't we tell them what the simulation is we still don't tell them when the uh, variable is predictive or not so they still have some uncertainty we don't you know we don't give we don't uh, reduce all uh, the all uncertainty we just reduce well we we shut down one uh, a source of uncertainty um, this, so these results, we just uh, started analyzing uh, this final experiment. And again, the, 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 uh, the, the experiment was done under quite different conditions. So where there are some somewhat weird things, it seems that uh, our subject spent uh, three times as long on each uh, round as when they were in the lab. So we have a suspicion they might have been doing other things at the same time. So we're, I'm not sure how, how much uh, we should, uh, I mean, we'll put it in the appendix, but at this point, we're not sure uh, how, how much we should uh, rely on these results. But, the, but for sure, I mean, the, the, what is the right investment model and how to, intrude, like, to include uh, uh, the noise in their own forecast that they seem to be aware of, uh, this is something we're still exploring. Any more questions from the uh, from the audience? So right, well. they, if if I can just uh, answer one one small thing on the uh, on what uh, Elena was. First of all, thank you for the discussion because it's super useful. Huh? And um, but what, so one thing uh, I. My personal view, uh, but this is just a personal view on uh, why people extrapolate, at least in our experiment, 
I agree that it's hard to uh, check whether something is IID or not, but it's very easy to check that uh, extrapolation doesn't work. So if they were actually using, uh, you know, if they had access to a, a like a simple regression tool, uh, they would immediately rule out uh, extrapolation. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure if it's still working, but yeah. And so, sorry, so just uh, about that, uh, it's just an anecdote, uh, but uh, I asked one of my child, uh, of my, one of my children who's uh, 15 to play the experiment, and he was immediately doing technical analysis, like looking for super complicated patterns. My impression is that there's a lot of that going on. Uh, but it's uh, just an anecdote, huh? but uh, I, I think it's natural to try and be smarter than uh, an IID process. And we tell them, you know, you could argue, we tell them what the average forecast is. When they don't think the signal is informative, uh, it's quite nice. They could naturally say, okay, I don't know, so I'll just use the average. That's not what they do. And I think it's probably because we try to be smarter than, uh, you know, we want to find a smart way to, uh, to, to, uh, to deal with the uncertainty. But, uh, that's uh, just a, a personal uh, uh, anecdote. Yeah, and some use their last forecast, right? I mean, instead of like having the memory of like all the processes, you you anchor on your last forecast. Too, so I don't know if you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's that seems to be consistent with what we know from I mean, the memory literature, right? The the recency, the you know effects are very very strong in uh, for the, the how memory uh, works as far as. As much as I know psychology, the psychology of this, so anchoring in the last forecast makes makes a lot of sense. But thinking that there is some autocorrelation persistence, kind of fundamentally, I think sort of it's it, yes, it's intuitive. But I don't think we have very good theory of why people start with the, from the prior that there is some persistence and try to come up with ways to exploit it. And and presumably it takes a while. And I don't know if you can benchmark this against again a Bayesian model where the the investor starts with a prior that there is some persistence and how long does it take them to learn it? No, there isn't any, and this is not a useful uh, useful forecasting tool relative to what these guys do uh, in your experiment. So just to, to briefly answer on that, we, we do see there is a little bit of learning. So towards the end of the experiment, they extrapolate a little less, but the, it's not very strong. What they do more and more is use the, the information in variable A. So they use it from the start, but the loading becomes stronger. So I think it goes back to what Elena was saying. Even though with a you know simple uh, regression tool, they can see you can immediately see that uh, extrapolating from the last return doesn't work. Just uh, eyeballing it is not that obvious. And uh, just uh, so, so and to rebound on memory, uh, in our case, uh, we tell them that each round is independent, and they don't use their previous forecasts to make their next. They they do understand that it's independent. So they they use uh, the time series they observe, but not their past uh, decisions or their past forecasts. All right, well, we should probably, uh, thanks to the presenters and the discussions, we should probably have our break. So we have a seven minute break and we'll be back at noon Eastern time for the um, PhD poster session. Thank you. <laughs>